the housing market has, well, it hasn't crashed, but it's, it's not looking all that good. We also have a yield curve signal that is, historically speaking, well, can be very important. And I think we should probably talk about that. And then we also have record amounts of foreign private investors, banks, credit institutions, whatever, that want to buy U.S. Treasuries, even though the Federal Reserve is hiking rates and everybody says inflation is going to be a problem forever, secular, whatever else. And all of these things are actually related together. This is uh, Eurodollar University. I'm Jeff. This is our weekly recap. And joining me, as usual, Mr. Stephen Van Meter. Steve. Jeff, th- th- thanks for having me. And yeah, it's pretty interesting that these foreign investors and private banks would buy bonds. I mean, nobody wants them, but we'll get back to that because we first we need to talk about what's going on in the housing market. And uh, why don't you, can you give us a rundown of uh, the, the numbers here and then we'll uh, jump off onto that? Well, there's a couple different ones. I know you wanted to talk about, uh, what was it, the NEHB sentiment index, which I mean, that's probably the ugliest of the bunch. Uh, home build, home builders, obviously, not looking very, not very optimistic about the future, and why would they? Um, you can talk about that. But we also had uh, permits and starts, home construction activity, which are way down, particularly in the single family segment. I think the single single family lo- number of starts is as low as it's been since 2013, which suggests that again, home builders are not thinking about high levels of demand, and they're actually probably wondering if they're going to be able to sell the supply that they have, they've have they already built up over the last year or so. So that's not good. And then the third piece the, this week was the National Association of Realtors, and they are the big one, which is the number of homes that are resold, existing home sales, which was well below 5 million annual rate, also the lowest that we've seen, in, I think, since 2013, too. So, and again, you know, home sales, home activity, real estate, uh, activity wise, number of sales, number of houses being produced, um, they're all basically straight line down going back to around January, February, and March, right? Yeah. And so let's talk about why the housing market matters. I mean, you, some people say, well, hey, these things are happening, but prices really aren't falling. And well, that, it's not an immediate effect that doesn't happen until people start to get desperate and cut prices. But when we look at the housing market, why does it matter? It's 20% of our economy. So if you start to see a slowdown. And again, we talk a lot about macro on this show is if you see a slowdown in housing, well, guess what's going to follow through to the rest of the economy. And why I like this home builder index, Jeff, is because what do we see during, you know, large credit expansions or, 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 booming economies is you see overconfidence. And we see that in the home builders that, hey, there's this huge demand for new homes. There's going to be a continued demand for new homes. And they have been building a ton of spec homes because why bother building the home that you or I want? I could just build one and you're going to be so desperate and so eager to buy it. You'll take it no matter what color, shape or where it doesn't matter. You'll pay any price to get it. Well, now that the interest rates are higher, all of a sudden, what are we seeing just the opposite, that home builder traffic, you know, from people looking at homes is, I mean, literally just plunged right off a cliff. It's dried up. So now you have this case where you have all these potential spec homes that are not done yet. Builders will have to cut prices. And that's going to backflow into, of course, the resale market, cutting prices and everyone else, because who's got the biggest margin? It's the home builders. You know, it's funny, isn't it? It's it's the inventory story in real estate. It's the same inventory, uh, uh, you know, problem that we've seen in the goods economy, where producers and sellers and everybody in the supply chain said prices, you know, the economy is going to be good. Prices are going to stay hot forever. So it doesn't matter about, you know, normal prudence or normal levels of just common sense, right? Because economists all said it, the government all said it, everybody said it in 2021, the good times are here, they're probably, we've overdone it so much that it's going to continue forever, prices are going to continue to go up, activity will never come down. In fact, we need the Fed to come in and slow everything down, it's going to be so good for so long, and now we get into the middle of 2022 and suddenly it's like, no, wait a minute, we've got to rethink all those things, except you can't just go back and undo everything that you've already done, and like retailers and wholesalers that are holding a number of enormous levels of inventory 
that they now have to liquidate it at best discount, but it more than likely going to have to liquidate. You think you're starting to see that too in the home sector, the real estate sector too, right, Steve? Because even though prices are not falling on a year over year basis, all three of the major home price indexes, which we didn't get updated last week, which I think are coming this week, they've started to fall on a monthly basis. So over the summer, the activity slowing down, we're starting to see the nibblings or the the, the initial the initial move toward discounting stress sales, as you're saying. Right. And I, and I think kind of, Jeff, what people may not be seeing here is that when you have these massive credit expansions, whether fueled by fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, or even back in history, money printing, what happens is you get speculation. And the challenge is, People don't actually see it as speculation until afterwards. They think, oh, the market goes up. It's because someone's buying it. They don't see that someone's borrowing money and buying it on leverage. They don't see that. They think, oh, well, the housing market must be booming because the builders have people lined up to buy them. No, they too are speculating that demand will continue. Look at retailers and wholesalers. They bought into this like everybody else and they speculated that there would be demand. And now the problem is, what we're seeing is a speculation is turning out to be there isn't any demand or very little demand and way too much supply. And that's a challenge because everyone said, well, inflation can't come down. Well, you're right. Prices may not come down, broadly speaking. You know, rents are not going to all of a sudden drop 10 percent. But is a, is a wholesaler or retailer sitting on, say, a TV that's about to be outdated by the next model? Are they going to sit on that? No, they're going to cut price. Can that builder afford to sit on that home and pay the taxes and all the things and all the people that con contractors? No, they're going to have to cut prices. And same thing you see in the resale market. I just saw an article this morning, Jeff, that home flippers are starting to panic. Well, they should be, right? Because all of a sudden you buy this home and you put all this money into it. And now you're facing the fact that there's no buyers. And all of it takes for prices to start coming down is one person to stand up and say, I'll take yeah, you know, Steve, to me, it's 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 a bigger issue than just strictly real estate in the, the housing market too, because there is a there is a wealth effect. It may not be big, it may be esoteric, it may be intangible, but people do tend to spend a little bit extra when they believe their home prices are their fallback savings, right? If home prices accelerate as they did in 2021 into 2022, people felt a little bit better, and that contributed to the psychological portion of the inventory cycle, right? Because companies saw consumers were a little bit looser, as we see now in the savings rate plummeting to lows. Um, consumers were spending for some reason, whether they felt good about their home prices or something else. I think that the the home price acceleration last year certainly contributed much to to the uh, the the frenzy in consumer spending too. And if home prices do start to fall on a widespread basis as they've started to do. And as you're saying, Steve, you know, as as uh, home flippers and sellers get more and more dis desperate to get rid of their inventory, then you start to see prices stop rising, maybe start to fall a little bit, maybe start to fall a little bit more. You wonder how much of a psychological impact that will have in broadly speaking consumer spending, which would be, as you know, at the worst possible time, because it's also the time that retailers and wholesalers are holding all this inventory that they're already saying we need to get rid of. So it's not just about home prices for me, it's about some of these second order effects becoming self-reinforcing cycles where consumers, maybe they just soften a little bit and that's all that it needs to happen for then uh, producers and retailers and everybody else in the supply chain to really start liquidating their inventory. Yeah, absolutely. And when we, as we talk about second order effects, one thing we know is that when you see curve inversions, uh, whether it's the two tens or other parts of the yield curve, something that also happens, Jeff, that you know, is banks start to tighten up lending standards. So even if, say, I wanted to go out and buy something uh, and finance it, I could go to the bank and say, look, you know, here, here's all my you know assets and income and net worth. And they could look at that and be like, yeah, you know what, though? Um, we need a bigger down payment and we know you don't have it. So there's this, that, that is another factor here, particularly if we start to see curves steepen, that we also know that bank lending standards actually get tighter if rates go down from here. And that's a big factor too, because you know all these builders, they need somebody to come and finance these homes. 
believe it or not, retailers, I know seems they, they need people to charge. Yeah, and credit cards, right? I mean, it, we don't think about it as getting a loan, but every time you swipe it, you're effectively getting a short-term loan. How about auto manufacturers? You know, we've heard, oh, there's a shortage of cars. Well, I think that's going to start to flip because we also noted recently that the resale market on cars, the price there is actually plummeting. Well, you need a loan to get cars usually. So there's a the whole banking fast, a factor to this whole equation that a lot of people just don't see. They think, oh, if rates go down, the banks will be eager to lend. No. That's why they didn't lend during the great financial crisis. It wasn't that rates were falling, if they didn't want to lend. Yeah, the balance sheet constraints, right? And it, I'm glad you brought up the uh, um, lending standards because we've seen that in the SLUS, which is the Senior Loan Officer... Opinion. Oh, that's it. I couldn't remember the other O's. S-L-O-O-S, Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, which the Federal Reserve puts out, Lending standards are being tightened in a way that we, we normally see in the downside of any credit cycle. Even though the credit cycle wasn't enormous this time, like it had been in the, in the middle 2000s, still, it's, it's, it's enough to create economic issues, which we are starting, well, we aren't starting, we've been following these economic warnings in various money and yield curves all year. We had a big one back in March when the two-year, 10-year spread inverted for the first time. And then in June and July, in July in particular, where the yield curve utterly collapsed, at that point, the two-year, 10-year spread just went completely underneath, completely upside down. And then a big, an, an, the next big one in line as the yield curve inversion progresses toward the front, just last week for the first time, and it was only one day, but that's how these things start. Just one day, the three-month 10-year spread inverted for the first time during this cycle. So that represents, Steve, right, another sort of escalating warning, another, another step in the progression of the market saying, we don't like what's going on here. Yeah, and as we've talked about in the past, this doesn't make a lot of sense to people. Why would the yield on a three months where I can literally get my money, let's be clear, get my money back in three months, be less than get my money back in 10 years. And it's not, that's not how we should think about it. What we should think about it is, is telling us there are structural issues in the market, in the bond market, in the financial system. And all the bond market is doing is screaming at the top of its lungs. Hey, bad things are coming unless there is a change here. And what would that change be? It means it's telling us the Fed is over tightened in, as we talk about today, that we're a little over a week away from perhaps even more tightening. And the bond market is saying, look, you've got to stop this or it's going to be very painful when we find out just what's really wrong under the system. Yeah, and there's any number of things for that. I mean, there's any number of possibilities where the market is betting on lower rates into the future. If you're just talking about general overview of what a yield curve inversion, it's really the market making a bet certain, uh, you know, taking into account timing, uh, which is highly, especially in the short run, as you know, Steve, it's, it's really difficult to time these things. But essentially, it's a probability that interest rates are going to be lower in the future. And the more inverted the curve gets, and the more of the curve that gets inverted, the more the market is saying absolutely certain lower rates into the future. And one of the things that you, we were talking about off the air before the show, you and I, Steve, was that we actually know this time who is doing all the buying? Who is the one that is actually inverting the curve most of the, at least most of it this year? We get that answer from the tick debt, ironically from the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department keeps track of foreign ownership as well as some other data that I like, I find useful in banking statistics, but focusing here on foreign ownership of especially long-term U.S. Treasuries, there has been record amounts of buying by these foreigners over the last several months. And the data only goes up to August. But in May and in August in particular, foreigners could not get enough of U.S. trade. We've never seen them buy this much before, right? Yeah, and, and oddly enough, or perhaps not oddly enough, it comes at a time when U.S. investors will sell at any price. They don't care. It, you, they, they, they're like going out to the street corner. Will you buy my bond? And someone walks up and says, I'll give you a lot less. And they're like, okay. And by the way, I've got another one and I'll give you less. Okay. And they're, and the US, so U.S. investors here, as you know, Jeff, are selling bonds at any price and buying stocks. And foreign investors are doing the exact opposite. They're selling stocks and buying bonds. And the question is, U.S. investors think they're right. 
Foreign investors think they're right, but history tells us who's going to be right. Yeah, that's so weird. I mean, you could even see this, right, Steve, on, on specific intraday trading. So, I mean, you'll see yields on longer term bonds that are down in the early morning tradings when Asia and Europe are open. Obviously, the foreigners are there buying U.S. Treasuries. And then as soon as the U.S. open starts, the regular session starts, yields go up. It's just as you say, the U.S. based people are selling because they probably, you know, I'm putting words into their trading action, but they're selling because they're afraid of the Fed. They're afraid of the U.S. CPI. And it just raises the issue. Why are foreigners buying for what must be different reasons? What are they afraid of? Right. Yeah. And I think this is something a lot of people don't understand is there's got to be someone to buy our debt. And we've talked about and we've heard about in the past, China weaponizing their securities, right? If they come out in the market and dump them all, it ends the way of life for most Americans. Now, oddly enough, what do you see today? We see Americans dumping bonds and driving rates up. And what is it going to do? It's going to destroy the housing market. Here we are going to the holidays and credit card interest rates have to be sky high. It's going to kill the holiday spending season. It's going to kill the auto market. And we would have never guessed, Jeff, I think if we could have picked who would be the one to create this demise, we would not guess it would be the U.S. investor. We thought they'd be the buyer of last resort. Turns out they're not at all. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's that's the we're sheltered because we don't see the direct impact of the U.S. dollar system affecting everywhere else around the world. Whereas, you know, foreign banks might be looking at U.S. Treasuries thinking these are a good bet because we want safe and liquid U.S. dollar assets. Because have you seen the U.S. dollar environment out here? It is incredibly disruptive. It is disorderly. It's awful. So and the, you know, we don't see that in the U.S. because we don't pay attention to the exchange. But we don't we don't pay attention to a dollar shortage because it, it, its impacts are felt most directly overseas. So in that respect. These foreigners are also doing us a little bit of a favor because they're sort of telling us that they're ahead of the curve, in this case, literally ahead of the curve, because they're willing to buy all of these treasuries, even though inside the U.S., the Fed is raising rates and focusing on the CPI, whereas foreigners are focusing on what we, you and I, Steve, believe will be the very thing that or one of the things that leads the Fed out of its rate hikes, which is this, the, the inevitable Maybe inevitable, inevitable, maybe too strong a word, but very likely uh, downside consequences to what a global dollar shortage represents. And so why are foreigners buying U.S. treasuries by the bushel full? There's there's investment reasons, higher U.S. dollar interest rate differentials. But by and large, they want safe, liquid U.S. dollar denominated debt or safe, liquid U.S. dollar denominated debts because they know safety and liquidity in U.S. dollar terms around the rest of the world is already a very serious, if not the paramount consideration. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeff, and if we add another component to this, if I was short dollars and I'm outside the U.S. and I have no realistic way to get them, but I can look and see that, hey, demand at my factory is down and I you know, go to my order book and I see that you know, demand six months out is down and I see all these things. What is one way I can get dollars? Well, I can take the dollars I have, buy bonds, and effectively I'm betting the Fed cuts rates, the value of my bonds go up, and I sell them at a gain and get back more dollars. And I think that's something here in the U.S. people don't think about because they have no reason to, as you just said. And yeah, that's right. We're, we're, we're sheltered from the consequences. But I think the big point here, what the yield curve is saying is that we aren't actually sheltered from the consequences. We just don't notice it as much as they do outside the U.S. And that's really, to, to me, and I think to you too, Stu, I'm going to put words in your mouth here, that the three-month, 10-year spread, when it inverted, that was another one of those, okay. You know, again, the yield curve starts out with a little bit way down the, e way down the end of the curve, like the 210s, way back in March. And then over time, it's just progressed further and further up the curve because, these things that we talk about, the dollar shortages, the economic consequences, the inventory cycle, they all seem to be, conver the housing bubble, they all seem to be converging in the near future, right? And that's really what the third, three months, 10 year spread is telling us. I'll give you the final word here, Steve. Yes. And uh, thank you, Jeff, because anybody who thinks that rates go down from now means everything comes out okay. Historically, doesn't mean that at all. Rates go down from now means bad things are getting worse. 
Yeah. So what a week to recap, right? And there's, there's even more. I mean, there's there's always more that we could have covered. Stuff going on in China. I think I'll probably have to do on my own this week. But uh, housing yield curve, dollar shortages, foreigners buying bonds. It was a pretty wild week. So thanks, thanks for joining me, Steve. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, Jeff. I look forward to it.